I'm Alexander Clegg, and in this section, we'll be talking about Habitat Sim Advanced Features. Specifically, we'll talk about tracking object motion with a camera, projecting 3D points into 2D, configuring semantic IDs for objects, and object asset configuration with template libraries. I'm going to assume you've already seen the Habitat Sim basics and interaction sections, and so I'll skip over some of the uh, basics here at the beginning. So I've already run all of these uh, cells, so I'm going to start with loading the simulator and the scene, and then building our target object GUI. So let's start with motion tracking camera. While agents in Habitat Sim usually act to modify the environment around them and play an active role as primary participants, there are cases where we want the agent to play a passive role or to simply hold the camera to record the results of simulation. If we run this script, we'll see the agent tracking the motion of an object as it simulates. This is pretty easy to set up. We'll first reconfigure the visual sensor so that it's coincident with the object, with the agent's transformation. This way we don't have to worry about pesky offsets or differences. We can just directly assign the agent's node. We'll set the transform from the spec once we do this to register it. And then we'll position the agent somewhere we want, this, in this case, just off the ground. We'll set up the seed so you can play with some different versions of this. And then we'll add the object um, into the scene here. During the simulation loop, all we have to do to track the agent's position is use the look at function from Magnum. We'll provide a camera position and a point to look at, and then we'll build the scene node rotation for the agent off of that look at matrix. It's converted to quaternion. Then we just run the script and there we go. So you can apply this any way you want to do motion tracking. And we have built a utility function. So you can really easily do this in this collab. Okay. So let's talk about 3D to 2D key point projection. Let's say you um, want to generate some key points in your 3D world and then put them on your image. So here you go. We have an image of a scene with a banana object and then a point showing the center of mass of that object in 2D viewport space. We provide a utility function here to do that. Essentially, we're going to grab the visual sensor that you want to uh, project in the frame of. We'll grab the scene graph, set the render camera parameters from your sensor object, grab that render camera, and then do the projection. This is just a standard using the projection matrix and then uh, converting that into the viewport. Once we have that 2D point, we can just plot it directly onto this image using our display sample function. So all we're going to do is add the object, uh, position it, and then grab that sensor observation and do this projection and display the sample on top. Voila. Go ahead and use this to do any sort of 3D to 2D projection that you might want. The last thing I'll talk about today is configuring semantic IDs. So we can load semantic information for a simulator directly, and we can provide that with per vertex colors um, for scenes. But we can also provide that for objects that we're introducing into the scene. So let's say you introduce a new object into a scene with semantics or without, and you want to configure a semantic ID for that object. We have three ways to do that. You can configure it before instancing via the object template, or programmatically in the template after you've brought it in. You can also set the semantic ID of all render scene nodes for that object directly with set object semantic ID. Or you can set the semantic ID property directly for any scene node in the world. Let's run the script and see what we get. Okay, we've loaded this nav mesh. Um, so that means we've loaded the scene and then here's our three images. And we have the same object, which each face of this object is actually a separate mesh component. That's important. You'll only be able to set the semantic ID for one mesh component. You can't do per vertex through the programmatic API. But you'll notice here we start with one ID, we've updated it to another, and then we've set one component of that to a third ID. So let's just dig in here. It's pretty simple. We set the orientation of this object. We're going to add that object into the world. And we're going to do so by first setting the template, setting the scale, and setting the semantic ID property directly into that template. So in that, whenever any one of these is instanced into the world, it's going to have this ID. 
Once we have that object in the world, we can position it, and then we can reset the semantic ID, overwrite it for the entire object, the set object semantic ID in the sim, sim API like we do right here. Alternatively, if you know which visual nodes for your object you'll want to set, you can set the semantic ID property of those directly using the get object visual nodes call to get a list of those and then reference them in. And you'll have to do some guess and check for this, but feel free to use a script just like this to do that and get quick feedback. Once you know the visual node, it'll always be the same when you load that object, that ordering. So go ahead and play around with this over here if you'd like. Um, you can get renderings like this and even import your own objects and uh, use this to set up your own semantic scenes. And thanks for joining me today. I am John Turner, and in this section of the tutorial, I'm going to discuss object customization and construction. Objects, like our friend here, the banana, are represented in Habitat by meshes. An object's render mesh, seen here on the left, provides its visual geometry, while its collision mesh, seen here on the right, defines its physical boundary during dynamic simulation. These meshes can be either loaded from files or synthesized by using Magnum provided primitives, and the nature of each of these meshes is treated as an attribute of the object they represent. Objects also have many other attributes that determine how they look and act within a scene, and all of these attributes are collected in a single structure called an attributes template, which acts as a kind of recipe for constructing a particular object. By modifying the values in the template before instantiating an object, a user can specify the object's appearance and behavior to be appropriate for their experiments. These attributes templates are created, retrieved, stored, and deleted via the attributes manager appropriate for their type, which is accessible through the simulator. To retrieve a particular template, the manager is queried and a copy is provided which the user can directly modify. This modified template is then registered with its manager, after which it's available to be used to instantiate new objects. I'm going to demonstrate how to work with object attributes templates to instantiate new customized objects, as well as how primitive mesh assets used for rendering and collision can easily have their geometry modified using asset attributes templates. The physics world and the scene are also both described by their own attributes templates, but we are focusing on only objects and primitive assets here. First, let's launch the simulator and load an appropriate scene for our demonstrations. Note the Object Attributes Manager reference right here. I will be using this later to access the Object Attributes templates so that I can modify them and create new objects. These dropdowns display various available object and asset attributes templates. Right now, we are interested in the file-based object templates. In the, listed in this first dropdown, representing objects whose meshes are loaded from files on demand. Let's use the banana. In this cell, I will demonstrate the results of a simple modification to the banana's default scale. I'll run the cell and display the results, and then we'll go back through the code and I'll point out a few highlights. Here you can see the six bananas, starting with the default banana in the leftmost position and ever larger bananas from left to right. How was this accomplished? Let's look at the code. First, we retrieve an object template corresponding to our default banana. We create an object using that template we find a good position in front and to the left of our agent to place that object and we put it there so that we can see him and his big brothers in a lineup. Then we iteratively increase the template scale, change the template name so that we save five more new individual templates, register that template with its new name and its modified scale value, and then instantiate new banana objects, either using the ID or using the new handle. You can use both. We move the offset in the X direction some slight bit so we can put the banana down next to its previous 
sibling, and we put it down in front of us. When we're finished, we want to get rid of our modified templates. So we find all of the handles with that string new by querying the object attribute manager get template handles. This list of templates are all of the templates listed right here that we created to create the bigger growing bananas. We then individually delete each. We verify they're all gone. And then we display that afterwards they're all gone. This next cell lists all of the attributes available in object attributes templates and allows you to edit many of them. We again get a copy of our banana template and we call this function show template properties. This will list out the names, values, and expected types of every attribute within the attributes template along with whether it's read only or editable. Then below here, we have many of these attributes with corresponding form entries to allow for editing. Notice that to set the value, you access the template's attribute as if it were a property. So let's set up a fun, long, skinny banana. Okay, there we go. Now, we've configured the template to be the way we want it to be. We make a new template handle for this modified template. We register this new handle and get a new template ID. Then we retrieve the original template and instantiate an original banana. Put it down to the left and in front of our agent. We instantiate a new banana using the name of our long skinny banana template and we put it down to the front and to the right of our agent and then we simulate it. Let's see what it looks like. Well the first thing to notice is that we have an output displaying the name, value, and expected type of every attribute within the object attributes template as well as whether that value is editable or read-only. Here, for instance, we can see scale. The default value is 1, 1, 1, as you would expect. And down here, we can see our long, skinny banana with the regular banana to the left. So far, we have seen objects created with render and collision meshes loaded from a file. Objects in Habitat can also be created using primitive based meshes. There are six possible shapes for these meshes and they can be either solid or wireframe. The objects instantiated from these meshes have the benefit of being very fast to simulate. In these next cells, objects are built from each of these 12 different primitives and displayed next to one another. Here we see the default primitive object and asset attributes templates. The object templates reference primitives as render and collision meshes whilst providing the same attributes we've seen before, such as scale, while the asset attributes describe geometric quantities of the primitive meshes themselves. These templates are always built when Habitat first loads and are always available to use to create objects. Running this cell will give us examples of the 12 primitive objects with their default values. We get lists of the handles for solid and wireframe objects, instantiate them next to each other, and display them all together. Let's run the cell and see. Here's the 12 primitive objects available six wireframe in front, six solid in the back. The geometry of these various primitive meshes can be customized to a degree, and like uh, with objects, these customizations are accomplished by modifying specific attributes templates acquired through the Asset Attributes Manager. 
The following cells provide an interface for editing and saving each of the available primitives attributes templates, and then instantiating objects constructed from these modified primitive meshes. Note the Primitive Asset Attributes Manager, which provides the same functionality as the Object Attributes Manager, but specifically for the Primitive Asset Attributes templates. We've made a function here to register the primitive attributes that have been edited. Note that these templates have a value, is valid template. Due to the nature of the geometric constructions that these asset attributes describe, not all values possible are valid for primitive objects. These templates determine if they are valid as they are modified, and this value will be false if an illegal value has been set in the template. No objects will be able to be created by this template until all values are legal. The primitive asset attributes template values that can be modified along with their descriptions are listed in the following cells for each of the various solid and wireframe primitive meshes. Legal values are enforced in this case by the interface. Play around with these values to see what impact they have. The differences are particularly visible with the wireframe objects. The final cell in this section will display the resultant meshes for those that have been edited. So let's edit a capsule. A wireframe capsule. Let's give it well, let's give it 10 cylinder rings around its body. Let's make it. And let's see what we get. And there is the wireframe capsule with many rings around its body reflecting our choice. And that completes the object and asset attributes template modification section of the tutorial. In this section of the tutorial the mechanism by which customized objects can be created in Habitat was demonstrated. Hopefully you will find these useful as you configure your scenes to best represent your experimental and research goals. Thanks for watching.